Oh, there are so many people here. And there are church bells in the distance. Oh. Hopefully you're not picking those up. Well, hello, friends. Leave a comment. Let me know if you can hear me. Because otherwise, I'll just barrel ahead and start babbling. Okay, just a second here. Oh, there you are. Let me just pop out the chat here. Sorry, I'm just tinkering, getting things together. This can go away. Okay, yeah, I see some comments there. Let's see. Uh, tell you about my, my t-shirt. What this? I like this t-shirt. No one may ever have this knowledge again. Um, it's from the Museum of Jurassic Technology in Los Angeles. And uh, what, it, what it is is they, they have a whole exhibit dedicated to crank letters that were sent to the observatory there. And this is one of the comments from the crank letters. It's letters to Mount Wilson Observatory. 1915-1935. If you're in Los Angeles, I really recommend it. It's a good place to visit. Okay, so everybody can hear me good. I'm supposed to start babbling. Yes, Ed, I will start babbling. I, I'm always babbling. What are you talking about? Okay, so uh, here's what I want to do. I want to talk briefly about Stephen Jay Gould and see if that triggers any comments, any discussion. Uh, but then after that, we can go in any old direction you like. So, yeah, ask questions, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so to talk about Stephen G. G. J. Gould, let me talk about my intellectual journey and why I'm a developmental biologist, and a lot of it is because of Stephen J. Gould. So um, he started publishing in Natural History Music Magazine you know, his regular column, This View of Life. And I think that was in, what, 1974? It was when I was in high school at any rate. And uh, it, was, it was an eye-opener for me because although I'd read some uh, basic biology texts on evolution, evolution was not taught in my high school. Not at all. It was of the evil E-word and this was in a fairly liberal high school in a suburb of Seattle. So, yeah, it was kind of disappointing, actually. Uh, I remember one of my, I, I took an anthropology course, and one of my projects there was I made a portfolio of drawings of hominid skull. Uh, so, yeah, there. Were, otherwise, I wasn't, there wasn't much exposure. And then I'm at the library. I practically lived at the library when I was in high school. So I'm at the library and I find this natural history magazine. I'm browsing through it. And there at the end was this magnificent column by Stephen Jay Gould. Uh, and he opened my eyes so much while he was writing that. So yeah, I started reading in 74 and I kept reading until when did he die? Was it 2000, early 2000s? Um, when he discontinued the column for obvious reasons. Uh, and so I read them all, it was great. I, I thought Stephen Jay Gould was brilliant and a great writer, totally enjoyed the columns. I subscribed to Natural History Magazine solely for the Stephen Jay Gould columns. And I, I've heard a lot of people have done that. 
Okay, I'm asked, did you ever find out why your high school banned the teaching of evolution? They didn't ban the teaching of evolution. We just had teachers who didn't care. So they, they you know, I'm I'm sure if if the teachers had been willing to teach about it, it would have been received just fine. But no, they just they just didn't bother. It was you know, it's an it's an ongoing problem that we have lots of otherwise good teachers who have never been exposed to evolution and are willing to discuss evolution. We had a training program here at my university for teachers and teaching evolution. And uh, a lot of the teachers just said they, they weren't confident in teaching it, that they were kind of afraid of the subject. Uh, they were also afraid of the pushback they would be getting from administrators and the public. So they're just, but they were willing to learn. And I, I think that's the case that a lot of people have been intimidated out of teaching it, uh, but they would they would love to do it. So yeah, good, good for high school teachers who get out there and, and do the good work of actually teaching some science. Okay, anyway, where was I? I was, I was saying I, I was reading lots of Stephen Jay Gould. And the thing I appreciate about Stephen Jay Gould was that he gave a broader perspective on evolution that as many of you already know his one of his big things was talking about pluralism and how there is more than just one mechanism behind evolution and he personally put a lot of emphasis on developmental biology so yeah i kind of like that and he also talked about other mechanisms uh, he's he's the guy who really got me interested in a, a broader picture of evolutionary mechanisms than just selection. And actually, I was born at just the right time because mid '70s, all kinds of cool stuff was happening. So I got some of my old books here. This is another book. Let's see, can you read that? Not with the glare coming off of it. There we go. Uh, has anybody else read this on development by John Tyler Bonner? really a powerful, influential book. It came out in 1974. Um, I didn't discover it until my first year of college, which was 75, 76, somewhere around there. Uh, it's a good overview in that it focuses on the questions. Now, how, do, how do we get these complex organisms forming? Um, what are the processes behind that? All that kind of good stuff. So yeah, this is, this is one of my favorite books. It, the, Along with Gould, I started thinking about, you know, more than just selection. There's also processes that generate form. So this was another big influence. Uh, then when I started college, there was a succession of books that came out. Um, here's one. So Ontology and Phylogeny by Stephen J. Gould. Does, have any of you out there read this? It's kind of a different book. You know, if you're used to reading Gould's column, um, those are very easy to read. They're aimed at a popular audience. Uh, they don't get too technical. Uh, this book is a bit different. It's, it's still a fairly easy read, but um, yeah, it gets, it gets into the down and dirty, nitty gritty stuff now and then. Uh, it's it's a was a really powerful and influential book because it's also a case. It also made a case to academics that development was relevant to evolution. You ought to study it more. You ought to look more at it. Of course, at this time I was just an undergraduate, so yeah, it was it was easy for me to say say that and then get into it. But I put a lot of effort into studying developmental biology, partly under the influence of this book. Uh, but then that naturally segued into evolution because of the foundation Gould gave me here. Uh, also at that time, there were a couple of other books that came. Uh, let's see, in 75, 1975, Edward Wilson's Sociobiology. That's different, okay? That's very different from this. Uh, I actually kind of liked the book. It, sociobiology is another of these really dense, long, heavy tomes. But the nice thing about it is it gave a lot of detail. And you could tell that Wilson 
knew a heck of a lot about insects and ants in particular because there's so many ant stories in that book. And that's what I liked it for. Um, I kind of was less approving of his final conclusion, which is very much a reduction, reductionist sort of biological determinism about human behavior. That that's, states it more strongly than he does. But it wasn't, it was a book that bugged me. Okay, that's also a good thing because having a book that bugs you prompts you to read more to figure out why it bugs you. So I, I consider that another great influence on, on my educational history. Uh, and then also, in, what was it, 1976? Yeah, I think it was 76. Again, I was an undergraduate. That's when Dawkins' The Selfish Gene came out. And I picked that up. And that was another really good book. Um, again, very different from Gould. The thing is, you know, people are always setting Dawkins versus Gould, and it sounds like Gould and Dawkins also set themselves against each other and consider themselves kind of intellectual opponents. But really, if you think about it, um, Dawkins beautifully and clearly describes one level of evolution. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. <clears throat> oh, man. It's a little dusty in here. But anyway, Dawkins is describing one very specific level of evolution. He's talking about uh, evolution at the level of the gene. And I think it's a really, really good approach. It's all, you know, I believe it. This is, this is a real factor. Uh, but Dawkins is kind of unaware or dismissive of everything beyond that. So Dawkins, for instance, has said that, sure, he's heard of neutral evolution. He just doesn't think it's very important. Whereas Gould was saying, no, this is really important. You got to learn about neutral evolution. You got to learn about ne uh, nearly neutral evolution. You got to learn about development. You got to learn about Evo Devo. Um, Gould was just saying, here's all these other layers that you also have to read. So it's, it's, it's like I read them both, and I came away thinking, you know, Dawkins really is on to something. And in some ways, and, and this is kind of heresy for me to say, but I, in some ways I think Dawkins was a better writer than Gould in the sense that Dawkins could keep a train of thought and stick to it for a whole chapter. Uh, Gould as a writer was more discursive. I don't think he could keep a train of thought for more than a sentence, and sometimes not even that, before he'd put in some parentheses and say something completely different. Uh, so, you know, for clarity and for straightforwardness, yeah, Dawkins. For depth, for diversity, for getting into these interesting, weird, humanist sorts of arguments that Gould often made, uh, he's the guy. So yeah, I, again, I've really liked them all both. Okay, so years go by. I'm now a full-fledged biologist teaching biology, teaching evolution, all that sort of stuff. And yeah, I, I throw some Gould at them. You have to read the Spandrels of San Marcos if you're in evolutionary biology. I occasionally run across people who are just angry as piss about, oh, that's 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 garbage. That's not true. You know, and uh, I don't get why people are so polarized against them. It is entirely possible to hold a view common with people who like Dawkins that selection is really important, and at the same time also hold more complex views about other phenomena going on in evolutionary biology. Uh, that, and I, I personally don't feel like they're in opposition at all. Okay, so, um, you know, you all heard Stephen Jay Gould died. He died of cancer. And before he died, he published his last book, his masterwork, and here it is. Okay. I'm wondering, have you read this one? 
This is Stephen Jay Gould's The Structure of Evolutionary Theory. It's massive, it's thick and complicated. Um, I know very few people who have actually read it all through. I, I have, but I will also confess it was agony to read this. It's, uh, it makes me so sad. Uh, so once again, Gould is making a strong, somebody asked, has anyone read it? Yes, I read it. I know a few people read it once and struggled through bits of it a second time. Uh, it's, uh, what can I say about this? There is some brilliance in here. And he's expressing what I consider a very important point of view about layers of evolutionary theory. That's, that's basically the theme of the book is that there's more than just gene selection. There's a whole bunch of different layers where um, selection and other evolutionary processes, that's another theme, is multiple evolutionary processes, operate uh, to shape the organism and to shape the population, obviously. But, oh man, this is, this is where Stephen J. Gould desperately needed an editor. All the worst afflictions of Gould's style come to the fore in here. Long, 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 long sentences, lots of parenthetical sub-comments, lots of asides. Uh, you, you know, you, this is a case where you really want to make a point with some clarity and he failed. He just doesn't. I, I, in some sense, in, you know, this is a great tragedy to read because you can see, you can see, you know, this underlayer of this marvelous point he's trying to make and he's crufted it over with so much garbage that you you can't really get to it very easily. So it's a, it's a technical book with some interesting ideas that is hardly ever read. You know, this this reminds me of a fantasy novel I've read. Um, let's see, uh, Tim Powers wrote a book called The Drawing of the Dark. Okay, it's a fantasy novel, so you, you can get away with a lot of things there. Uh, but in this fantasy novel, there's this little subplot where there's this retired artist who's painting He's, he's sketching out this dramatic prophecy, this prophetic painting on the wall of his home. And, you know, for the first part of the book, everyone just kind of goes by and say, oh, there's that crazy artist just kind of scribbling away. And then later, the protagonists of the story realize this is a work of prophecy, and it could be really useful to see what's on this wall because it would tell them what's going to happen in the big final battle. Uh, and they scurry over to his house and they find that he has died of starvation because he was so infatuated with his writings. You know, that's, that's kind of Gould, died of cancer, but he was really infatuated with his own writing. Um, and what he'd done is he'd drawn it so many details and he'd sketched it in so thoroughly that the wall was just solid black with charcoal markings. It was completely unreadable. This is kind of, kind of, uh, that's a metaphor for this book, I think, unfortunately. Okay, questions. So I got a question. What is, what is Gold's position on, on increases in morphological complexity driven by natural selection or some kind of entropy that builds up when... Oh, he wrote a whole book on that. Uh, which one is... What's it called? It has it had a couple of different names. Um, it's also notorious for his heavy use of baseball analogies. Uh, but anyway, he's, he made the point that if you look at a, a graph of complexity, there is a wall, a lower limit. And so the only direction you can evolve in terms of complexity is slowly outwards. So he's saying you butt, butt up against the left wall of minimal complexity, and just by random walk, you will get species that are increasingly complex. It's like if you're you're a drunk, you're you know the drunkard's walk problem. Only there's a wall on one side of the sidewalk. That means that inevitably, at some point in your long journey, staggering home, you will end up in the middle of the road. Uh, so he, that's that's his argument there. So yeah, he's it's there's nothing about selection in it. 
it's just saying this is this is a natural process. Someone like Gould didn't just need an editor, they need a brutal editor, someone willing to put away the pen and take out the machete. Yes, he desperately needed that. Um, he, okay, Blake mentions a book, yeah, The Full House, The Spread of Excellence from Plato to Darwin. It's a good book, I mean, it makes a good point. Um, but that, that's his argument. Oh, and you first heard about Gould from Dennett's critique and Darwin's dangerous idea. I am so sorry. Darwin's dangerous idea, don't tell Dan I said this. It's a terrible book. He gets so much wrong about evolution. It, it was, he, he was a classic pan-adaptationist. Pan and uh, yeah, ignore that. Okay, uh, Matt says, that's similar to the neutral evolutionary hy ratchet hypothesis. Yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of along, well, it's, it's kind of along the same lines that, okay, that there are natural mechanistic processes that will tend to bias evolution in certain directions. Things like Mueller's ratchet, well, that, that's going to cause an increase in molecular complexity because once you add elements to a complex pathway, for instance, uh, you acquire a selection to specialize them into their roles, and then it becomes impossible to break it back down without losing all of the function against irreducible complexity. But creationists never understood that. Okay, so anyway, the book, Structure of Evolutionary Theory, I don't recommend it. I flatly have to say that. Uh, it's just not a great read. But you know, if, if you're desperate for a complete survey of Gould's work, it's, it's kind of in there. And yeah, I really wish he'd had an editor, a really savage one. Um, you know, I've only met, I only met Gould once. And that was briefly as part of a group at, at one of the neuroscience meetings. And uh, I, so I can't say that I know him personally very well at all, but from various accounts, yeah, he's, he had a bit of an ego. And I, I think that took over with this book. And the fact that he was dying at the time and knew it meant he was pretty much able to deny any editor from tinkering with his work. And it's, that's really unfortunate. Now, I will mention, so like I said, I do not recommend the structure of evolutionary theory on this here, a glutton for punishment, and you really want to get, you know, I, I think there's ideas in here that an evolutionary theorist could explore much more thoroughly and with much more focus than Gould did and really add to it. But here's the other thing. Uh, in the middle of that vast book, He's got a summary of punctuated equilibrium right here, this book. This book, it's titled Punctuated Equilibrium by Stephen J. Gould. You can order it off of Amazon. It's a little cheaper than the, the monster book. Uh, and it's basically a chapter from roughly in the middle of, of the structure book that's been ripped out and published and it's really good it's 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 very relatively for gould it's relatively concise it comes to the point it's got data it talks about the implications of punctuated equilibrium it's it's this one i highly recommend um it's excellent go read it uh you know when i was when i was getting ready to talk about this i went to Amazon to see if it was still available. It was. And I started reading the, the featured review of the book. And it's just glowing. It says wonderful things about the book and how important it is and how important you know, punctuated equilibrium is as a theory. And I'm reading this and I'm thinking, hey, that's a really good summary. I wonder who wrote this. And I get to the end of it, and it was me. So I, I wrote a review of this book for uh, Nature and it got published and apparently they just pulled that out and used that in Amazon for the review. So yeah, go, you can just go read Amazon. You can read my summary of the book. 
Um, it's good. It's worth it. Uh, I'm still going to do a video specifically on punctuated equilibrium. Uh, it will be taken largely from this text and also from uh, Stephen Stanley's book. What was that called? Uh, Stephen Stanley, you know, shortly after punctuated equilibrium came out, was uh, wrote a book called, oh man, I'm blanking. Anyway, the name is Stanley. Look for punctuated equilibrium. And, and you can find it. It's a it's another really good book that is not purely Gouldian. It's a paleontology and, and morphology book, but it was pretty good. Okay, I have to mention one other thing before I just turn loose and let you ask me all kinds of questions. Uh, the punctuated equilibrium theory was actually come up came up with first by not Gould, but Niles Eldridge. And it's really unfair not to mention Eldridge, who seems to be in the shadow of Gould in many cases, although he's got a very distinguished career of his own. He's doing great work. Um, he's retired now, but he was the director of the American Museum of Natural History. I think he was partly responsible, at least, you know, at least in authorizing the major restructuring of the American Museum of Natural History fossil exhibit, which occurred several years ago. I I can't I'm I'm old. I can't remember how long ago it could have been. It could have been 30 years ago, and I'd think, oh yeah, that was just the other day. No, uh, anyway, the American Museum of Natural History is it's an educational marvel if you go through, for instance, their dinosaur exhibit, because everything is organized cladistically. And uh, I'm asked, will I let people in the Hangout or is it just solo? I will let people in the Hangout send me an email and I will check my email in a moment and maybe I'll bring in some other people. Okay, anyway, so the American Museum of Natural History, just go there. Uh, because what you do is you go through it and you are led step by step through the key characters that are used to classify dinosaurs, for instance. And so you can actually learn a great deal of anatomy and cladistics and tree construction just by going through this exhibit. And I wish, I wish every, you know, I was, last year I was at the Science Museum of Minnesota and, you know, it's part of a grant and I'm helping them, advising them on some other projects. And we went through the museum and that's one of the things that I recommended to them is, Man, you got all these great fossils and you're wasting them. You just got this fossil standing all by itself. You know, this big skeleton of something. And you don't have it in context. You don't have it time. You don't have anything. It's just, there's a little label there. It says, oh, yeah, this thing is from the Jurassic or whatever. But there's nothing about the relationships. And if you're into evolutionary biology, it is all about looking at relationships between different organisms. Okay, let me let me just for a second. I'm going to switch to my mail here and see if anybody is requesting is re requesting a chance to join the hang. And yeah, I will consider that. Where, where, where? Okay. No, that's not it. The thing is, I have about a dozen windows open, and each of these windows has about a dozen different <laughs> tabs open. So it's kind of, let's see, oh, where did it go? Come on. No. Oh. Uh. Talk among yourselves while I try and sort out my mess. I'm getting there. No, that's not it. Yeah, it's great. And then I can't even find my email in this mess. Ah. I never claim to be well organized. Okay, just a minute. Let me do it this way.
Okay, I'm back. Nobody has sent me an input. Nobody sent a request. Okay. I'm just not that popular. Anyway, if you want to join in the chat, yes, do send me an email and I will see what I can do. And I'm back focusing on this again. Okay. So let's see, questions here. Does anybody follow football? No, I do not. Not at all, although I, I will admit to this, since I'm on sabbatical, I told my wife, we ought to go to one of the university's football games. And uh, oh, we're gonna do it. September 22nd, I'm actually going to a football game, our homecoming game, just because. Let's see, hey PZ, have you seen the debates on Pang Burn, oh, right there, I'll stop you. Uh, I am not going to pay any attention to anything coming from Pangburn. Reactionary, right-wing, alt-right, liberal, centrist, horrible, horrible people. I know that that's crap. Let's see, another question. Should I go to the Ark Encounter or the museum? Maybe, maybe. Uh, my, my personal philosophy is I had to go because, um, because if I'm going to criticize the place, I have to have an informed criticism. So I went through them and took a look and yeah, you know, and I still tell people if you, if they ask me, sure, if you, you know, if you get a chance, if you're in the neighborhood, check it out, you know, go in with a critical eye, um, uh, I, I think some more about that is kind of important. Let's see. Yeah, the art costs over forty dollars. It costs it costs me something like fifty or sixty bucks with parking. It's a real racket. So that's something to watch out for. Um, let's see. I'm sent a message on Google Hangouts and via email. Oh, uh, yeah. Let's see. Email's best. Why am I not? Hmm. Nestle's email may have been eaten. I don't know. Okay. Oh, this social media stuff. I hate it. Largely because I'm no good at it. Let's see. I am not seeing it anywhere. Oh, let's see. You sent me a message on Google Hangouts. That, mm, okay. Okay, let me, well, while, while, I'm, while I'm opening things up, let's see. Uh, I got flunked from a class in evolution for endorsing Claydism. What? Who's teaching this kind of course? I mean, really, um, cladistics is kind of essential for understanding evolution. That's, that's just, yeah, okay. Yeah, tetrapods are a type of lobe fin fish. A derived form of lobe fin. Let's see, what else we got here? Uh, could you speak some to how we measure whatever we measure what? It's about this long. No, I, I don't know. Ah, uh, let's see. Okay, what is your current rate? Let me, I'll get back to that in a moment. You can get the same experiences of arc by putting bird sounds on YouTube and walking around an empty room. Yeah, that was that was the thing that drove me batty about it. They get this long intro where you walk through this 
these passages, these twisty passages to get up a level to where the exhibits are. And all they are is empty crates and sound effects to make it sound like there are things stuffed in them. Uh, it's pretty bad. Oh, you sent it to my other address. Yeah, okay, just, I got it, I got it. Let me, let me find this. Yes, I have, I have multiple email addresses. Oh, there we are. Okay. This leg will be joining us shortly. Once I so oh, now I'm losing everything. Okay, there we are. I clearly need a bigger computer. Okay. Okay, this leg, check your email, it's on the way. Um, all right, where was I? More of these questions. Uh let's see. How dangerous is the Ark Museum? I know they're trying to get school groups in there. Uh, you know, in, in, it's it's a weird thing, if you ask me. It's it's not dangerous to me, because I can go through and see how stupid it all is. But uh, yeah, they do try to get school groups in there. Uh, when I visited, there were several buses of Bible vaca vacation Bible school groups who showed up. And for there, it's it's terrible because here are these young impressionable kids, and you're exposing them to this total nonsense. Yeah, so uh, you know that should not be allowed. Um, you know you can't do much about something like vacation Bible school. Sure, they're gonna they're gonna bring their people there. Sunday schools and church groups will go there, uh, but public schools should not. It's just bad for public schools to do that. Uh, let's see, I think the Ark Encounters traps inside, they take the victims away for white slavery operations in the deep south. Yeah, let's, let's spread that rumor if we want to get sued. Okay. Um, Hello, are you Amy? Oh yes, hello. Hello. Okay. Uh, Whisper uh, Cash 9 wants to join in, can I? Uh... Add him to the uh, chat. Sure, yeah, go ahead. Let's see, another question. Does anyone know whether a guppy or a fruit fly has a more complex brain? Um, I don't know guppies, but I know zebrafish. Zebrafish have more neurons in their brains, but fruit fly neurons are individually more complicated. So that's really a hard one to judge. Um, Oh, adult zebrafish definitely have much larger brains, yeah. but uh, baby zebrafish, you know, the age I worked at was like two to two to five days old, and they're, no, they've they've got about 100,000 neurons in the spinal cord, another 100,000 in the brain. So they're bigger than a fruit fly, I would say, but uh, whether it's complex, I don't know. Okay. And also, there was somebody in the live chat who said that he, he got flunked from class. because I saw he, that. Yeah, yeah I, I, I had I had a, I had a similar experience when I tried to explain to my uh, teacher that the water molds, the ohm sites, are not technically um, uh, fungi under the cladistic system. They were considered fungi because they had similar lifestyles, but he, he just didn't accept uh, the the science on cladistics on that. He just said, "No, yeah. no, they are they are fungi." Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm going to trust the molecular information more than things like, oh, they have the they have similar lifestyles, because I think there's a lot of convergence yeah. of that sort going on. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Ohms are, are, are interesting. They belong to a photosynthetic clade, and they lost the ability to photosynthesize, and now they are parasitic, like fungus, typically uh, are. Oh. Huh. Okay. Right. Hello, Chris. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We got, we got, we got three whole people here. Wow. What are we going to talk about? Mm -hmm. Let's see. Another question I got asked was about my own personal research. Uh, and here's the thing: I don't talk about my research because there were a few times I actually got scooped when I back when I was much more open about it. So I, I don't talk about the details. I talk. I can talk about the generalities. Uh, so this summer I've been exploring. 
uh, spider development because I've been reading these things about spider embryos and they're really fascinating. So I'm at this stage where I've just, I've got a couple of spiders over in my lab, nicely tucked away. We've just recently had a batch hatch out. Uh, I've got I've got a male I'm going to combine with a female later this afternoon and, and try and get the whole thing going. Um, you know, at first I'm mainly thinking for educational purposes that students want to work in my lab and what would be what would be cool is if I could hand them here is an egg sac study the development of these little embryos and this this year I plan on working out all the tools that they can use to do that so um, it's going to be more of an exploratory sort of thing at this point that's yeah. that's what I'm up to spiders are pretty neat my favorite type of arthropod uh-huh yeah I I when I I can't I can't come up with a favorite. I I really like all. I, I, yeah. I they are all they are all pretty neat because, because I am uh, my favorite. Uh, how's it called? The MCU uh, superhero is Spider Man. So that's that's, that's why I I pick the favorite. <laughs> I pick Spider's favorite. <laughs> I, I certainly I certainly prefer scorpions. Um, uh huh. Scorpions are neat. But mostly because you know they're uh, viviparous, which is yeah. And some of them are actually placental, so that's really cool. Uh huh. Well, I'm I'm going to agree with Nestle on one thing that would be really cool to study spider embryology. So bring me Spider Man, and we will breed him and collect some embryos, yeah. and see how they. Yeah. But that's actually a question. Have the comic books explored that? He's supposed to have all these spider genes. Weirdly, uh, it's, yes. it's weird. <laughs> it's it's, it's a was... massive, it's massive horizontal gene transfer somehow. Somehow, well, yeah. Well, actually, if I remember right, they wanted to retcon it so that he could actually shoot webs out of his wrists, like the um, oh the yeah, movies. oh no, oh. And that involved, if I'm remembering this right, <sighs> he mated with a spider and then became the spider and then gave birth to himself. Yeah, or something like that. I, I yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's, it's, it's really it's, weird. It's, it's, yeah, it's it's the weird, weirdest uh, chapter of the Spider-Man yeah. comic book. Like, uh, yeah. he he he, beca he transformed into a gigantic spider, and then he cocooned somehow and gave birth to himself, and now he has this new ability to actually shoot out webs from his wrists. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> this idea of him mating with himself to give birth to himself, this sounds like something christians ought to be just fine with yeah life finds yeah. a way life finds a way yeah okay that's that's just weird yeah yeah, yeah of, they, of course comics don't want to be scientifically accurate about everything well, well actually it's it's more that the people writing the comics thought that the movies were really stupid to have him actually shoot the webs out of his wrist but they were told no you've got to do it because that's what people expect now and so they just came up with the stupidest thing to explain it that they possibly could. Mm -hmm. And it was, yeah. Just, yeah. So that's what they did. Yeah. Yeah. I've, you know, and also, and also, and also if, if Spider Man was accurate, he would shoot the webs out, out of his butt. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, in my youth, I was really into comic books and I read a lot of comic books. Uh, but I don't think I can go back now because when, when, I've, when I've looked at a few of them, their their stories have gotten so convoluted and twisted in, in upon themselves, and so many extra layers added, and they're they're pretty much incomprehensible to me. Uh, they would have to go back to basics to capture my interest again. So, yeah, and I I can sort of see that the movies are going in the same direction. Well, the new Spider-Man uh, is a pretty good reinterpretation of uh, the actual yeah. character, in my opinion. Well, that's kind of what I'm afraid of, is this constant reinterpretation. And it, it, you know, we were talking about ratchets before and the <laughs> wall. It's, it seems like every time they reinterpret it, it gets more and more yeah. twisty and less and less plausible. Is it that what happened to Jesus? Like the, like the version of uh, Luke and the version of uh, Mark? <laughs> all all yeah. reinterpretations of the same character. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, I I feel like I've just come out as a puritanical purist for comic books, but I'm not. It's just 
I'm not that interested in the, the latest reimaginings. Have you seen the latest uh, uh, Marvel movies or the, don't you watch them? No, I do. I'm See, I'm in this little bitty town and I really like movies. So every time a movie comes out, I am compelled to go see it, no matter how awful it is. And so, yeah, I've, I've seen all the Marvel movies because they played. Of course they played here. They were big box office successes. And some I enjoyed, some I thought were kind of eh. Um, let's see, right now playing in, playing right now is Black Klansman, which I kind of want to see. So that's a good one. But also uh, Crazy Rich Asians, which which sounds terrible, but apparently it's really popular. Yeah, I, I, I got I got a bit of a jar from the title too, but uh, yeah. apparently it's a good movie. Just a just a comment on the Marvel movies, though. Like, has there ever been a series of connected movies that's been that big and has been that good overall? I'm not saying that they're all great. Yeah, I don't think so. It's hmm. sort of impressive in that sense. Yeah, I mean, there, there's it harkens back to the old serials. You know, it used to be you'd go to the movie. This this is dating me. This is when I was really young. Uh, they there would be some before the main movie, so there'd be short, you know, connected stories that you had to attend week after week, to follow. Um, so yeah, there there were things like they weren't they weren't this big gigantic production like. Right, and like movie. they had, you know, the Bond movies, but those weren't really connected to each other no. in any real way. Um, so, I mean, that obviously it's a big budget series, but it's not really, yeah, it's not really a cohesive whole. Mm -hmm. um, and it's yeah. certainly not in the same time frame. I, right. I mean, Marvel's just spitting them out. And, yeah, uh, and they have a plan, and there's right, there's an organized. Although I, I was really disappointed they basically threw away uh, Waititi's Thor concept in the last movie. But anyway, there there is kind of an organizing principle to them that sort of mm -hmm. kind of hangs together. You know, I was um, the, the, the thing I'm afraid of there too is all the other studios are jumping on the bandwagon. You know, DC is trying and failing horribly. Oh, Universal, no well, that's, that's just... Snyder's fault, though. Well, yeah. well, 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 well the, uh, the Wonder Woman movie was very good. I, I enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, because guess yeah. who had nothing to do with that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Wonder Woman is good. They're coming out with Aquaman, and I'm, I'm kind of hopeful. Yeah, yeah it, it, the trailer was good, and uh, it, it looks promising. And, and I think they had the Moses saw something on the, the, the trailer. It's pretty, yeah. it pretty interesting. I think. From, yeah, from what I've heard, it. from what I've heard, and I don't know if this is true, but I've heard that it's good but not great. But in the context of a DC movie, that means it is great. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we'll see. I'll, we'll see. It, it oh. will come to this town, and I will be compelled to go watch it. Uh, I, I've seen an interesting question in the, the chat. What part on a human would the spinnerets actually be homologous with, like the kidneys oh. or the testicles? <laughs> That's a very difficult question. I don't. I don't think there is a homologous structure that we have to spinnerets. No, I would definitely think not testicles, but. <laughs> They could, you know, they could be part of the excretory system. I'd have to look into that to see what yeah. they're homologous to. Uh, the, the, any homology would be extremely distant. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, it's like it's like asking what is homologous to a liver in an insect, and it's there is an organ there, but it's rather radically different from what we have. And also, it's presumably not derived from the same basal. Correct. Source. So it's yeah. yeah, I mean, except maybe ultimately, you know, you kind of think of, you know, there's there's all these primitive features that are associated with having a salome where you've got excretory structures and so forth that then get wildly modified to make other features in the organism. So maybe it's like it's like the eye. There are so certain aspects of all eyes that are homologous, like the PEC six. Gene, yeah, which which indicates that the common ancestor had like a a, uh, a light sensitive light sensitive patch of cells, but these got modified into very different ways in later groups. Well, of course they had a light sensitive patch of cells. Yeah, yeah. I mean, your skin is sensitive to light. 
I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, in the way that our retina perceives, yeah, in, yeah, not 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 in the right. other way. But, yeah, I'm just saying that, <laughs> like, yeah, like yeah. So being sensitive to light is not exactly a difficult thing mm -hmm. on a chemical level. It's right. I, I would think that the key thing with Pac six and so forth is not necessarily the light sensitivity part, but the localization. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that, yeah, the, the, that here yeah. you got an organism you want to put eyes up here and you look around and what spatial patterning genes are being expressed in that region and in all of us it's homologous it's it's pac6 and things like sonic hedgehog and uh, those all working together to make the pattern that mm -hmm. we then adapt to the head so I, I think it's more likely that yeah you got you got this nice spatially localized pattern of gene expression you couple that to photoreceptor expression, and you get an eye. <clears throat> the question, what genes would be inserted where? For what? For what? For eyes or for for spinnerets? Well, for for I I have heard that the uh, the uh, the opsins are part of like a gigantic superfamily of proteins, like the G, yeah. uh, the G coupled protein uh, receptors. Yeah, and these, and these are and these are related to like things in the immune system and then things in our olfactory system and also uh, there was the other one. Um, hmm. uh, I think there the, the yeah, other aspects. Uh, yeah, yeah, various, right. various different functions. Yes. Yeah, there's the ciliary and rhabdomeric opsins, which we all have. I mean, we have ciliary and rhabdomeric opsins expressed in our tissue. Uh, we just take those and we specialize them in different ways. So in us, for instance, the ciliary photoreceptors are primarily visual receptors, whereas the rhabdomeric ones are used for things like circadian rhythms and just detecting general light levels. And that's reversed in things like uh, the arthropods. Yeah, and, and again, just to further that point I was making earlier, the um, same opsins that are involved in um, sensitivity to blue green light are also found in skin cells uh -huh. so i i just yeah i mean that this connection is I like yeah you you need sensitivity to light for more than just seeing things it's uh, i shouldn't say need it but you know yeah. what i mean yeah i mean, it, it, I, I, mean you, I mean you you, you glenn i can't see things in the same sense but it, it does have a uh, protein that reacts to light and that and by that it can be, modify its behavior in reaction to that, uh, yeah, s s sensation. Yeah. So, you know, the thing is that, that vision is incredibly easy to evolve. That all, you know, you've got this, you got this energy source pouring in from the sky, and it can chemically modify things. You know, I tell all my students, you know, if if your parents have left out that pla cheap plastic lawn furniture on their deck. For years, you discover it gets more and more brittle. That's because light reacts with chemistry and it will change its structure. So you just, that's all you need to start putting together some kind of photoreceptor. The tricky part of, of vision is patterning and organization. You need a, you need a membrane organized with, with a grid or a arrangement of photoreceptors on it. And what's more, that has to project into a central processing unit in a co coherent spatial pattern. Mm. Uh, so that those are the hard parts. That's why I say pack six. I bet you it's really just a spatial issue. Yeah, it's just where it uh, is. New, new question. What? Uh, so what? Oh, wait. So which organs are actually derived from common ancestral organs between arthropods and vertebrates? Uh, considering, considering that they separated before things decided which end was the mouth, probably not much. Yeah, and, and it also depends on what you mean by homology. That you know, if you're asking, you know, what's the specific tissue that transformed into the same organs in vertebrates and invertebrates, and I would say I'd just throw up my hands and say I don't know. And, uh, and, and that's the way that I read question of homology generally is because uh, otherwise you're just talking about two things doing the same thing. And I don't know that that's either as meaningful 
or I mean, it's really not informative in any way. Yeah, yeah I mean, except if you again, if you take the molecular perspective, you can make a pretty clear argument that you know that, for instance, the opsins in invertebrates and vertebrates are related to one another; they're derived from the same common ancestor. Yes, so so that is the the interesting side of it is that there may be that there are some um, evolutionary pathways, as it were, that are that are uh, basal and easily followed, right? And so that that once they've they've diverged, and now even though these are developing independently, the everything sort of uh, set up in such a way that the easy the path of least resistance is going to be the same. And so they kind of go in the same general direction, but they're not since they're not developing through the same pathway from the same thing in in rea uh, in the actual history of it. It's not going to be um, homology in the same way that you know it is between a fish and a human. It's but anyway. Yeah, yeah. And homology turns into a tangled web the deeper you get into it. So. You know, it's. I, I I often think it's it's simpler and clearer if we just do like you mentioned to just say okay we're gonna we're just gonna talk about tissues the tissue level and what's homologous there uh, then then we can make a case but when we get into the molecular level then we start getting into some, some of these complex these complex combinations of things have changed and and interacted in new ways and yeah okay another comment here fifty dollars for the ark encounter in kentucky versus free entry at the dc natural science museum yes yeah, i agree that's it is an easy decision uh if you're out on the east coast don't well cincinnati is a little bit of a drive to washington dc but yeah there's there's no there's no competition there Smithsonian is so much better. So you know the question, there are many molecular ways to do a thing, but nature determines what those things and things are. Uh, nature, what? I, if I'm, I'm guessing Anybody? here, but, but I think that the question is, is that um, th the things that you want to do molecularly are determined by the environment and yeah. want in, a, in quotes here. Um, and so, you know which which particular way you end up doing those things you know it's there's a lot of variety there but which ones you're doing right it's kind of like you know you how do you how do you swim there's a lot of ways yeah. to swim but the need to swim is determined by the fact that you're living in the water right and it's also you know, another factor is what other genes are present because genes interact with genes and so you know if you've acquired some mutation for some other one some other trait that may influence what's easiest for the other traits to do. But, and then mechanisms are things like chance. Chance is an important one. Contingency, what, what, did, what was evolved earlier. And, and of um, course. And of course selection, so. And the really important thing, which is that most evolution is not adaptational. Correct. And, yeah. and that's, that's a thing that I run into so often with people is, is just this refusal to accept that, no, actually, most of this is not, it's, it's not being selected for or against. It's just, it's, it's just happening. And then maybe at some point later, there's selective pressure acting on this stuff that's accumulated. But that's a yeah. separate issue. Yeah, and that's one of the things that infuriated me about Dawkins. To go back to what we started talking about, uh, um, Dawkins openly dismisses all this neutral evolution stuff. Uh, he agrees that it happens, and of course he does. He's a rational person, so there's there's all the evidence for it. He just thinks it's not a particularly interesting facet of evolution, whereas I tend to think that's probably one of the more interesting things going on is all the diversity we have in life on Earth is largely a product of chance variation. So, yeah, that's all really important. Okay, here's another question. We'll challenge everybody here. Um, would it be possible to resurrect animals like dinosaurs using ancestral gene re reconstruction and synthetic genomics? 
and I'm going to be the negative Nelly and say, no, it, it won't. you'll get a whole different creature. I, I'm confused by the idea of resurrecting dinosaurs. I mean, they're still around. Right. Yeah. What do you mean by dinosaur? Um, although, you know, you know, Jack Horner has been, he's written a book on it and he's got these grandiose plans where he's going to use a, a bird, a chicken as the base and just sort of add new features to it to get back to dinosaurs. And by dinosaurs, he seems to mean um, bird-like creatures with teeth that are bipedal and not wing. Well, oh, I've got to give him this. If, if he managed to um, take a take a population of chickens and through selective breeding and, and pressure and modification and everything else, make something that looked like a T-Rex, it would in fact be a dinosaur. Because but, it was already a dinosaur. Yeah, right. I mean, <laughs> but no, can you can you remake a T Rex? No. How, no. You don't you don't have that information. You and even if you even if we we found the entire T Rex sequence chiseled into a rock somewhere, right? Could we then incorporate that? into a chicken's genome and then actually get one? I still think no. No, there's, you know, that, that, that's another thing about development is it's it's dependent on the cytoplasmic environment as well as the external environment. And we would have to have that information as well. So we'd have to have a whole dinosaur egg that we could stick our you know, artificial genome in. Yes, the cat is doing things. Anyway. Okay, uh, let's see. Oh, here's another interesting question. What's the number one thing about biology that I, as a physicist, should be correcting my fellow physicists about when they stray out of our field? I'd have to hear what they're saying. Well, I think he's asking, you know, generally, what what ticks you off when you hear a phys physicist announcing something. Um, one, of the, I guess one thing, one very general thing I'd say is the, the determinism that physicists tend to bring to things. You know, I, you know, even the quantum physicists, they seem to be thinking like billiard balls bouncing around that if you just know the path, you can predict what's going to happen. And, um, I guess one thing I'd like to tell physicists is no, it's it's much less soundly determined because we're dealing with large populations and many events within them. So, yeah, it's it's much more complicated. Um, I guess another thing I would say is biology is a heck of a lot more complicated than physics. That physicists are farther along in understanding physics than biologists are at understanding biology. So just- well, They've got fewer variables. Oh yeah, and they, they're artificially working to restrict the number of variables in an experiment. I, I mean, if, if you could track down the starting positions and velocities of every single thing relevant to bio, a biological question, then sure, I think you probably could determine the outcome, but good luck with that. I mean, the computational power for that alone would be so obscenely high to, to just track every interaction of every electron because that's what you would need to do. It, you, you couldn't do it. So yeah. is it the question, is it determined, is one thing. Pro, yeah, I think so. It seems to be. Can you determine it? No. Well, we might we might disagree a little bit with on that one. I'm I'm not so sure it is. So, you know, given ultimate knowledge, I I don't that there are too many chance events that go on. That you know, for instance, just look at human behavior. That so much of our behavior is a matter of our history, our our interactions, what we've learned, and that involves thousands if not millions of people who you don't predict ahead of time you don't know you don't know who your parents are going to be 
And all of that stuff shapes you in complicated ways that, you know, I, I don't think it's easy to predict. Oh, no, it's absolutely. I think it's impossible yeah. to predict. But yeah. what, what I'm, I'm just trying to distinguish between the question of whether or not things are, in fact, mechanistically determined from the question of whether or not people could ever, in practice, yeah. figure out what's happening. Certainly, you okay. can't. I mean, no, it's, it's just too complicated. There are too many issues. It's, it, I mean, it, it's impossible. It's like you can't even predict. I, I think no one would disagree that if you flip a coin, the physics involved determines if it lands heads or tails. But you can't even predict that accurately. And right. you're going to predict all of human interaction. It's, it's, it's insane. But that doesn't mean that it's not ultimately determined. It's just good luck with it. I mean, you, you can't do it. Yeah. I, I, I mean, there, there is a level where I think we would have a disagreement that, you know, if, if we get to a small enough micro level, if we're looking at, you know, individual atoms or subatomic particles, the question is, is that deterministic or is there some, some other random unknown something that's influencing them? And I, I don't have an answer for that. I don't know. I'm, no, I, I, I tend to favor the determinism you're talking about. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I don't know either. Does this go back to the uh, the Gould uh, uh, hypothesis of running back the tape and then let it uh, go again? Yes, we could do that. That, that his famous thought experiment. Um, and, and again, I agree with him. There, there are biologists who think, no, if you run it forward, you'll get exactly or nearly the same result. Uh, Conway Morris is one of them who thinks there is there is a preferred track that everything is running on that is leading to bipedal humans or humanoids. Uh, I think Gould is right that no, you, that's not the case, that there are too many chance events and too many other alternative pathways that could be taken uh, to be able to predict that sort of thing. Let's see, I think it's more like if you knew the wave function of the entire universe, you could, if you had enough computing power, know the state of the wave function anytime in the future or past. Okay, maybe. That's that's another one of those thought experiments. Well, uh, except that the computer needed to do that would need to, by necessity, need to be bigger than the entire universe. So it would have to exist outside the universe. Yeah, you would need you would need yeah. several multiverses worth of computer or several universes worth of computing power to compute accurately the action of one universe. And, uh -huh. and, and so now you've just got this even bigger problem. I mean. Yes. And then we need an even bigger universe to calculate what the, that first although, level is. Doing. Although you could say that the entire universe is a computer for determining what will happen in that universe, yeah. and it's doing it at one-to-one -one scale in real time. Okay, sure. But, but again, this is just getting into weird philosophical stuff. That, yeah, but know, when you make that argument, you're you're essentially admitting, well, we can't predict the future. Oh no, yeah, we're we're waiting for that calculation to be completed. Yeah, exactly. And it's like it's yeah. I, I have a I have a time machine. It only goes, but it only goes forward at one second per second. That's. <laughs> Oh, let's see. Blake says running a simulation like that would be fantastically unethical. This is yeah, okay, true. But if if we have the power to run that kind of simulation, we are clearly the superior group, the superior species, and might makes right. So we can do whatever we want to those petty little electrons whizzing around in our computers, right? Oh, that's terrible. Okay. All right, here's, a, here's another point. Uh, elaborating on reconstructing dinosaurs. It does not have to be an actual dinosaur, but I'm aware of research in which ancient genomes are reconstructed, at least an estimation. Can that estimation be used to resurrect the animal? Maybe. Um, you know, for instance, we've, we've got enough information from frozen mammoths that you could imagine extracting that DNA if we had molecular technology in, 
in advance of what we got now, you could then reconstruct the chromosomes and insert them into you know, a mundane elephant's oocyte. And you know, maybe then you could get something that would be mastodonish yeah, or but, mammothish. At the same time, as you were saying earlier, the um, you know, the, the environment for gestation in an elephant is presumably fairly similar to a mastodon. Whereas with a dinosaur, you know, that I don't think that you can do that in the same yeah. way. Yeah, it screw us up. I mean, because you know, development is an ongoing process. And even in the early embryo, there are molecular factors in the cytoplasm that are affecting what genes are getting switched on or to what degree the genes are getting switched on. And maybe there's something, some key something there that elephants do that mammoths didn't or vice versa. And we wouldn't know. Mm. No, no, the most later uh, a SciShow video about how, how elephants avoid getting cancer. I think, have you watched the video of uh, SciShow? No. It's really, really interesting. How do they avoid getting cancer? I would like to know. And they have, they have <laughs> duplicate, duplicate versions oh. of uh, genes, I think, or so, so, a type of gene. I don't know specifics, specifics. Okay, so not something I can personally do. I think they've got like, they have a bunch of extra copies of P53 for one thing. Oh, yeah. okay. That, that might be it, I think. Yeah. I will look for the paper. I think they, I can think I can pull up the paper really quickly because they have, to, it's cited in the description. Yeah. Yeah, there are, there are easy things that can, you know, in an evolutionary sense, easy things that could be done to increase the reliability of replication, for instance. Uh, but you got to wonder what are the trade-offs? I don't know. Yeah, well, also... Well, well, why, why haven't we evolved to, uh, to have more resistance to cancer than, than we are? Maybe, if, well, wasn't there a... Chance, because of chance. chance <laughs> and because we haven't been selected for it. Although, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if we're not now undergoing some selection for that, for those kinds of genes, as longevity has increased, we don't. We're we tend to live longer than animals of equivalent size. But for the there to be selective pressure, you need to have people having offspring, and after the time set of usual onset of cancer. So unless you've got a lot of people who are mating in their seventies and eighties, I I don't think that you can really do that. Wait, the mating part is doable. It's the reproducing part that's that's likely. Successfully, yeah. successfully yeah. mating. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's uh, although yeah, th what I'm thinking though is things like, you know, once upon a time we had huge numbers of people that would be dying off in their 30s, which is you know by other causes than cancer usually, uh, and they're now living into their 40s and 50s. And people are having children in their 40s. So that's, that's what I mean by a, a new selection regime might be operating to increase reliability. Certainly, and especially on some of the more early onset uh, types of cancer, um, which, which would actually be, you know, which would actually have an impact. But, you know, if you think about in, in terms of um, the broader selective pressures, then obviously you're talking about a disease that won't affect you until after your you should have already reproduced and actually yeah. not just reproduced but, but brought your offspring themselves to reproductive age and so even if you want to look at it in terms of the the idea of um you know grandparents are going to help raise the their grandchildren well even then at at the generation time that they're still going to be passed so it's there's just no not much not much selective pressure yeah. against cancer in the long run. Okay, but I'm just I'm just going to make a an, an argument in defense of a selective hypothesis, even though I'm I'm not that committed to it. Uh, one of the possibility is it's not the lateness of reproduction; it's that uh, we are increasingly investing more in uh, maturation before having children. And so in general, people in you know, 
countries like ours are having children fairly late and they're having relatively few of them. So that means that each child is a greater relative investment. So there could be, you know, that if, if, if I wanted to make a hyper selectionist argument, I could say, well, you know, but then what could be going on is that we're seeing selection to minimize childhood cancers because that's a bigger chunk of your investment, your reproductive investment that you're losing when you have a child with cancer. Well, yeah. the, this, is the, this is the figure I uh, mentioned uh, from the article. It, uh -huh. uh, it illustrates a, a, a broken version of another gene that uh, makes the cell very sensitive to damage. And with basically any type of damage, it makes it go self-destruct, basically. Uh -huh. Okay, so there's there's one trade-off then is they're they're having a higher cellular cost because you're going to be losing more cells to this yeah. effect, but uh, it's not preventing them from getting very big. So yeah, and and, and the, uh, the the video of Saisho says that uh, this growing uh, cells from elephants is really hard because they are so so sensitive to any type of change in the environment. That uh -huh. it's, they basically won't grow, or they basically commit suicide if anything changes. I, I wonder if that gives them a greater likelihood of fertility problems then. Hmm. You know. More research. <laughs> there, that's always the answer is give us more money so we can do more research. And we want to do research on elephant reproduction now. Yeah. And maybe we can, maybe you can figure out some, uh, a new drug against our cancer. Because of this, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, unless you know, it could also have the effect of reducing human fertility even more, which has pluses and minus. Yeah, but, but of course, as intelligent designers, we can perhaps figure a way around that problem. Unlike well, evolution, <laughs> presumably you would want to use that as a ther uh, therapeutic target, though. Yeah. So you, but yeah. Yeah, you wouldn't. You wouldn't want to take your offspring and genetically modify them. To have this extra gene. No, no, no. <laughs> course, or, perhaps, or, or perhaps gene therapy, not, not yeah. changing the offspring, like something like that. Yeah. Oh, has, it, has it been gene therapy tested on cancer nowadays? I, th I think it has. Oh, there some, was on some cancer. Yeah. There was something in the news. There, there, have, been, there have been many um, gene therapy trials, but various yeah. types of various types of gene therapy. Um, the success rate hasn't been as high as what one might like. Uh, it's, yeah. it's sort of hard to transition between models and so. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's also a very young field of research, of course. Right. And, and yeah. it does, you know, that... And, 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 it, and it didn't really, really start there because I think there was one case where a patient had a very severe reaction and died because of a trial. Oh, yeah, that was the... Yeah. That was several years ago. That's, it was, uh, a, it was a, very, a very bad image because because of that one severe case, all of the research got basically a bad press yeah. Yeah, on that. Yeah, but, you know, again, that even if we got around these problems, there, you know, here we got somebody calling himself CRISPR right here. Anyway, you know, things like CRISPR would you could go in and modify a gene, but you don't know what the effects of that modification will have on all the other genes. That there's going to be a multitude of pleiotropic effects. There's going to be all kinds of genetic epistasis going on, and uh, to do that experiment on a potential human being is. It's kind of ethically dubious because you don't know what's going to happen. You might you might make us you might make a little kid who's resistant to cancer but has some other completely unrelated mm -hmm. problem. I do, do like like things like turtles. They they, they don't get cancer, but are, are there uh, negative side effects associated with uh, negligent cellular senescence? Yeah. Uh, or are there uh, are they? having more diseases of some, of some other type because of their unique ability to avoid cancer? Yeah, these are all the kinds of questions you'd want to answer with extensive experiments 
Mm -hmm. And in some ways, experiment and biomedical research don't go along very well together. You know, if, if that biomedical research is specifically targeted for humans, because... I just want to point out that turtles do get cancer. That's... Oh, really? Oh, oh. Everything gets cancer. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yes, yes. But I mean, I mean uh, t t turtles live very long and they, they get a, a cancer at a very low rate. Yeah, I, I, I would I would guess, <laughs> but it's it's kind of like uh, you know of of mammals, the two species that have the lowest rates of cancer are dugongs and sloths, hmm. and one of the reasons is simply much much slower metabolisms. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. If so, you know, if you're not if you're not pushing yourself that much metabolically, turns out you're going to get less cancer. So, yeah, the answer is we all have to sit around, get fat, not move much, and watch TV. <laughs> Except that storage of fat is itself a metabolic activity. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Oh, there's, there's no way to win. We'd have to give up our but, greasy fried food habit. It, what, actually, what you need to do is, is eat as little as possible to survive, and then move as little as possible to reduce the caloric requirements and okay. then you should live longer and in fact you will live longer yeah. you just won't be very happy with it yeah yeah but, it's, uh, it's, it's just you can't your, ho your, hom your, your hormones constantly scream more food please yeah. Di diet restriction is very well established to improve longevity that's well known um but you know it's not necessarily the most comfortable thing. Yeah. We could, would, you, would you be more depressed because of like a lack of food uh, that, it, that your brain basically needs into, in order to be satisfied? I, I don't know. Yeah. I could be wrong. <laughs> so another comment. We could beat cancer if we didn't have so many damn cells. Quit, get rid of all your DNA before it mutates. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Let's go, you know, if we revert to the single-celled state, if you're single celled, you don't get cancer. You yeah. can't get cancer. So I guess that's an example of. Mm. Oh, there's, an, there's, an inter there's a question that I have had because I've seen some people suggest that the HeLa cells are a new type of organism oh, on yeah. its own, new species. Is it, is it true? There. Oh, I have heard that the HeLa cells are a new type of oh. species. Is it, is it true or is it. Uh, They're reproductively isolated, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. So, they, um, so they, can, they can qualify as their own species? I, yeah, well, where's John Wilkins? He can tell us all about species concepts and explain to us why that is or isn't a good answer. Yeah, uh, species are blurry and fuzzy and, uh, yeah. yeah. But I, I think if humans went extinct, the HeLa cells would still go on. On their own, I think. Uh, I really oh, no. Yeah, they, really? No. No, they, they need they need fairly significant maintenance. They grow uh, they grow much better than a lot of other cell lines, better than most cell lines. And in fact, there have been several occasions when somebody was um, trying to culture cells and they realized at some point these aren't the cells I thought they were. These are yeah, the cells. Yeah. But yeah. you still do need the culture media and mm. you need incubators and you need all of these other things yeah it's precisely like precisely controlled temperature yeah. co2 levels all that sort of thing so and yeah I, they're they're yeah. infectious and they will spread everywhere but everywhere means everywhere that has this specific kind of conditions in their incubator now yeah, I, 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 I heard to argue that they are so good at survival that they can very quickly infect lab laboratories all, all around the world right yeah right. No, but no, that's no, not, not exactly <laughs> Yes, except yeah. that when, when humans go extinct, the laboratories go extinct too. So. Mm. Now, if they can move from being able to infect culture flasks to being able to infect the scientists doing the culturing, <laughs> then you might have yeah. an argument, but I don't see that happening. This is a very good start for a doomsday movie. <laughs> yes, then it would be like those Tasmanian devil cases. Devils, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but again, those require that you have... Uh, a grossly tormented population that has limited genetic diversity mm -hmm. 
because yeah. normally, you know, if, if that sort of thing sprang up in humans, it might affect a small number of humans, but then most of the rest of us would mm. recognize that as a foreign cell and, and attack it. Yeah, and at this point, whether they are a species or not boils down to technicality, but I think they are a special case on their own, the, uh, the HeLa cells. Yeah, I'd be happy to call them a, a new species. It's it's a, just a new species with a very narrow environment that they get. Yeah, narrow. Yeah. Like a, like a species that uh, basically it's basically a virus. It's very dependent on, uh, on a specific group of humans trying to uh, cultivate them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you know, we're going up on an hour and a half. Mm. This is probably a good point to release people from their computers so they can go out and do exciting things in the waning days of summer. Oh, we want more. We want more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I as I mentioned, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to come out with a punctuate equilibrium video later this week. Mm. Um, oh, and was, Jackson, Jackson Witt is going to publish a uh, video on stasis pretty soon. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so I should. Do you know when he's going to be done with that? So I can. Maybe I, 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 I don't know. know. Okay. I, uh, I, I, we just finished with the, with the script, and uh, I usually he, he publishes it within a week or so. Okay. Within a week, yeah. Okay, I'll look forward to that. But, but, and, but don't push him. <laughs> don't push him. <laughs> no, no, and nobody better push me either because yeah. I, I get I dig in. Uh, then also this week on Wednesday at 7 a.m. my time, oh boy, uh, I'm meeting with a guy from Australia in a hangout. And we're going to, he, he's a historian, and we're going to talk about Jesus. Oh, God. Oh God. Yes. <laughs> exactly. And, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and he's, he's going to explain to me why historians legitimately think that Jesus is a real historical figure. Mm. Is, he, is, so, he a, is he an atheist or, uh, or is he he's Christian? an atheist yeah mm. so uh, he's he's coming at it solely from the perspective of a historian and uh, you know asking the question without the bias of believing in a, a, you know a, a mythical supernatural Jesus anyway so he, he's going to argue with me a little bit which I will learn from I'm looking forward to it. So anyway, but that's that's at 7 a.m. Central Time on Wednesday. <clears throat> you'll just most of you will, will not be up then, so you'll have to uh, wait. I, I will be up, I think. <laughs> okay, well, yeah. So we'll see how that goes. I, I will be working, I think, at, at the time, but still, okay. I could probably watch it. Very good. Mm -hmm. All right. So with that little preview, we'll let everybody go and. I uh, will talk to you all later. Thanks for joining in, CRISPR and Nestle. Thank you. Yeah, thank okay. you. Talk to you later. <laughs>